Oh, okay. So, so I apologize, everybody. If, if you were not listening before, um, th this is a, a, a student from, from last semester, and he did a really good job in the class. But uh, what do you think that could be changed right off the bat? And I, I, I put his name in um, anonymous. So what do you think that, that he could have changed in, in, in doing this paper? I mean, like just, just one th thing off right off the bat? Yeah, uh, Helena says that the title is capitalized, exactly. So what you would need to do here would be, and by the way, the, the, this is a really great student and I really like him to death. So, but anyways, though, he could have done things a little bit be better. He could have said, instead of saying here, right here, as Helena said, is technology going to make us stupid? Yeah. So you would want to put the, the main titles in capitalization. Also, if you notice here, like, like look here at my mouse. What's wrong with, with, with this? Yeah, exactly, Helena. Extra space here. So you would not want to put an extra space here. So what you would do to fix this, I mean, you could always do the, the backspace and, and that. I mean, that always works as well. But you always want to make sure that you have extra spaces here. And also, what is wrong Again, not even looking at the, at the content here. What is wrong with this font? What would you say to, to, to this? Yeah, indent, exactly, Kai. Indent is not consistent. You see here how this is like center font. You want to make sure that you have left font or uh, what they call it, uh, like just or um, I'm 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 sorry, left justified. Um, sometimes you'll you'll see that if we go up to the top here, sometimes you'll see that oh they they put it in justified font that's actually incorrect. You want to make sure to have left justified. Okay. And I mean, we can kind of go through the um, the particulars of this, but I mean, like you, you can even see here, right here, it's it's centered, it's it's not left justified, it doesn't look correct. And then even even right here. He has like, you know, will te technology make us less in intelligent? Uh, well, uh, e even if that was a good headline, it, it's not formatted correctly, right? And then he goes on, we, we can get more into detail about this paper l later on, but let's go through the slides for 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 this week okay so once again remember that i want you guys to be able to do any kind of paper that you think that is is what your interest is in okay so there are some possible topics of course you know you can go through these ones here Physical versus digital books, um, athletes and a whole kneeling con controversy and, and so forth. And, um, you know, is football safe? Should parents allow their children to play? Should college be free? And is overpopulation a, a huge problem? I will tell you guys that um, 
for next week, remember, I want you guys to think about the, the paper for next week. And also this paper could be something that you could do, turn into the final project. Okay. So, but for Wednesday, um, there's, there is going to be a time to say it's a, a topic that I've decided on and, um, and I, I wrote it actually um, the, last night. So it's, 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 it's not going to be a little, uh, like kind of like last time where you guys had a choice necessarily to, to choose between various topics. Um, actually, it's, 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 it's a timed essay and it's a topic that I chose. And, but it's not something to be intimidated about. Um, in fact, as long as you listen to today's class and also particularly Monday's class, I think, uh, you'll, you'll be in fine shape. So it, nothing, nothing to worry about, okay? So just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you the topic and I want you to think about it. And the main things to point out with that topic is actually well, well actually you're not supposed to see that okay <laughs> um let me point out um actually uh that that <laughs> you don't you're not supposed to supposed to see that either um I do want to point out this though, and we'll get into the, the the timed exercise. But but first though, these are just some things that um, I, again we're not going to go through these right now. But uh, this is a great site that if you ever want to check out this um, English grammar and. The thing I wanted to point out, maybe I don't have it pulled up necessarily. Give me one second here. Okay, so I, I don't think I have it pulled up here necessarily right now, but um, well, here's something to consider. Remember that the, the schedule for this week, uh, remember that we are on this schedule. So we're gonna go over the um, slides for the little seagull and and they say I say, but the main point though that I, I just want to point out though is that for the next paper, you want to be sure to talk about what you say. Okay, so you know I, I can speak differently than than maybe other professors that you might have, but. What I'm concerned is that you have an opinion. And I mean, since we are the in the election season, um, you know, you could vote for somebody and that's that's totally fine. I just want you to be able to explain why you're voting for like one person or the other, or the same thing goes with the paper. I want you to be able to to talk about, okay, why you are arguing this way or that way. So again, it's, it's a little bit different in, in my class than maybe other classes, but I want you to be able to be able to explain why you are arguing one way and you're graded not necessarily on your opinion because everybody's opinion's a little bit different, right? But I want you to be able to explain why your opinion is 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 
different than somebody else's and how can you justify that opinion so i don't know but just in the chat box does that make sense to to you guys yeah helena yeah absolutely yeah yeah so what i'm going to do right now is I want to go through a couple slides here. Remember that these are, are topics for the next paper, so you can see this. But also, I want to talk a little bit about the, the readings for this week. And remember that what they say, what the author says on page 393 is that 95% of newsrooms probably went to private institutions and this is going to be really really um, significant when we talk about Malcolm Gladwell here in a second because one of the things that he says we won't probably get to this today but we're going to get to this in Monday's class that Malcolm Gladwell talks about this very fair very very fact that a lot of times people think that if you go to Harvard or Yale or an I or Princeton or an Ivy League school, you think that you're going to be getting a great education. Actually, that's not necessarily the, the truth. So you guys that are going to Seminole, and I can tell you this also, I mean, people that went to UCF, they are getting the same quality education as you are. And um, it's a total mistake to think that like, oh, well, if you if you go to, you know, Seminole State, as opposed to Harvard, that, oh, you're you're inferior. Um, don't get into that mindset. Because actually, you're way more in, intelligent and a lot of times way more likely to be successful even if you go to Valencia or Seminole State or any of these other colleges and um, it's not just me saying this but it's also true with people that teach at at UCF they say the same exact thing so um I want, I want to show you guys some clips here. And also on page 395, they the author talks about, so if you have an education, it's affordable, but is it actually worth it? And, um, and let me kind of skip past the, this bullet point right here, but, uh, One of the things that the essay brings up is that it could be possibly wrong. I mean, let me just kind of ask you guys in the in the chat box, do you guys think that you have to go to a Ivy League school to be correct or to be successful? Like, what do you guys think about this? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that, that's one of the great things about Malcolm Gladwell is that he, he kind of explains this and he, he talks about that. So let me go ahead here and flash. And then, oh, okay, R real quickly, um, capitalization in your essays, it matters, but don't stress too hard because there are different rules that apply for you know different <laughs> different schools and and um, different papers different essays and so forth so capitalization matters but don't stress too hard on that um that's one of the things that the little Siegel um book talks about um but that being said for italics it does matter now <laughs> i, I kind of say this 
kind of jokingly because, you know, right now I can't literally, I, I literally cannot uh, type in italics. It doesn't let me in this uh, keynote format. But just in general though, for, for titles, you wanna make sure to have them in italics. So when we talk about italics right here, what we're talking about is, you know, book titles, film titles, TV show titles, etc. You want to have them in italics. Okay. Also, now we're we're gonna talk later, um, probably next week. But we're gonna talk about resumes and cover letters. But obviously, when you're ever like addressing for a cover letter, when you're ever addressing somebody, you want to make sure to put their proper name, like doctor, um, prof like professor or, or prof with the period or miss and miss. Now, I, I just want to emphasize this right here um, with Ms. Okay, even if you know that the person is married, even if she is a missus, right? Um, you always want to address them as Ms. Because a lot of times, and, and, and by the way, don't use Miss, M-I-S-S. You always want to address them as Ms. Because that's the, you know, formality. That, that, that That's what you want to use, okay? So, if you're talking to somebody and let, let's say that you're applying for a job, you want to address them as doctor, prof, like, you know, professor or Mr. or Ms. Um, but always use this MS uh, because sometimes that can, <laughs> that can have kind of a backlash if, if you don't do, do that. And by the way, even if that woman's not married or whatever, even if you know her history, you always want to use Ms. right there. Okay, so one thing I, I do want to kind of close on before we get into Malcolm Gladwell is that the textbook, I know that it talks about numbers. Um, let me just say that the textbook, remember that MLA kind of comes up with this in about, you know, every, every single year. Okay, so the general rule, even I know the textbook talks about it uh, um, differently, but the general rule is that, um, let me just point this out here. Let me just type this up here. Numbers that before 10 need to be spelled out. Numbers after that So it's 
So basically the general rule for MLA, at least right now, is that if you have numbers that are 10 or less, in fact, actually it even goes up to 10. Okay, so 10 or less, you need to put them in numerical form or, or letter form. Anything over 10 right now, at least, you need to uh, put them in numbers, okay? Does, I know that it is confusing. I mean, I will tell you that in, <laughs> in our class, in my class, I, like, I, I don't even care necessarily. I mean, as long as you're doing a good job in terms of writing, that, that's, that's fine. But I just wanna give you guys a heads up for the, the future, for your future classes. And by the way, I, I know that uh, a lot of people in the math department don't even care right <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a ridiculous thing to to kind of teach you guys but i just want to give you guys a heads up so does that make sense to everybody yeah exactly okay yeah <laughs> so it's, it's it is kind of weird but uh, let's kind of switch gears to this. Um, I know that we, we covered this for last semester, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, like last class. And we talked about this for a bit. But let me go ahead here and skip ahead here. So I think we left off right here. So what's what's really interesting is that this psychologist looked at married couples and he was able to determine within one hour, just looking at this couple, whether they were going to, you know, to be together in the future. And he was about 90% accurate, um, actually 95% accurate. And then just 15 minutes, he was 90% accurate, just looking at this couple and, and actually, before I, I, I go further, does anybody in, in the chat box, you can j just let me know, but um, does anybody know that they can like look at a couple <laughs> for 15 minutes and they know exactly whether they're going to be together, what, whether the relationship is going to last? I mean, can anybody... Think of, of a situation like that where they, they they were able to determine within 15 minutes whether this couple is going to last. <laughs> so Renee says yes. So I think I, I left off at this point. And we looked at that, uh, the video, and then we we looked at some of these slides. Um, and I think I kind of teased you guys with talking about what month do you think that people are successful? What month do you think that might be? Any guesses? So Helena says October or September. So Helena, let me ask you, are, are you born in, in those months or one of those months? Okay, okay. So this is, this is really interesting. And 
one of the things to to point out is that this is actually a psychological thing. So it's not just that Malcolm Gladwell is is uh, is being anti like September or whatever you might be, but there's actually a psychological reason that um, behaviorists have have focused on. So let me go ahead here and I'll, I'll show you a clip here with him where he, he kind of explains it. Also, the um, even before I play this, I, I just want to point out that like psychologists have looked at this and this is very true. And a lot of times students will, will ask me like, oh, how can I be a better student and, and so forth? Actually, a lot of it has to do with hard work. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it's obvious, but but a lot of times students will come up to a professor and they'll say like, "How can I be really, really, you know, successful?" Well, a lot of it has to do with hard work. And so, what Malcolm Gladwell points out here, um, and you're going to see this actually in a minute or so, but what he points out is that if you look at the Beatles. Everybody thinks of the Beatles as this huge, great rock band, okay? And they were. I mean, obviously, they, they were. But what a lot of people don't understand is that they had to work so hard, and they were very successful. They played a club at Hamburg, Germany, and they did this, like, relentlessly. It was basically you know, 10 hours a day for six days a week. They did this religiously, okay? And a lot of people, of course, understand the Beatles are the, like, the, probably the, the, the best rock band of all time. But what most people don't understand is that they had to earn that. And they spent so much time, hard work, that was the, the main thing that they did. And that's one of the things that, that Gladwell talks about here. So I'm gonna get to these other slides here in a second, but let me just show you guys Let's turn to marking for a second, because one of the deemed greatest fiascos of, of modern time was the introduction of new Coke. Yeah. Now you see this entire fiasco also as a, as a prop. Okay, so let me just back up for a second here, and let me just talk to you guys about this. So when Coca-Cola was marketing their product in the 1980s, okay, it turned out to be a complete disaster because what they were doing is they were running taste tests with Pepsi. And it turns out that Pepsi won every single taste test. And the reason why is because Coke was doing these blink tests and it turned out to be a complete disaster. So. But let, let me kind of, I'm going to actually go back to this here. Let me, but I, I just want to um, show you this because this kind of explains what I was talking about, about how certain people are born in, in a, you know, a, a couple months and why that makes a huge difference. So let me, let me show you this and then we'll go back. Malcolm Gladwell is probably the best-selling nonfiction writer in America. He sold many millions of books based on very simple ideas. Blink, should you trust your first impression? The Tipping Point, how does a fad become a sensation? His new book, which is my favorite, is called Outliers. In it, he explores what makes a person successful, 
Why do some talented people flame out early while others go on to brilliant careers? His main point is this. Success doesn't have much to do with talent. Instead, he says it's almost always a product of hard work and of the culture in which one lives. Malcolm Gladwell, thank you. Thank you for having me. One of my favorite examples is actually your first example where you talk about hockey players. And yeah. the way, the reason I think you talk about them is because what could be more meritocratic than sports? You just, you know, it's, it's, it's not who your parents are. It's, it's just a question of raw talent uh, mm -hmm. and hard work, it would seem. But what do you find? Well, you find, this is this, some lovely work by a series of psychologists. Um, uh, what you find is that an overwhelming majority of hockey players are born in the first three months of the year, elite hockey players. And the same is true, by the way, of soccer around the world. And the reason for that is that the system, the age, the system under which age class hockey and age class soccer are organized has, <coughs> excuse me, has as a cutoff date, January 1st. And so from the very beginning, when we pick young kids to pull them out and put them on all-star teams and give them special coaching and special encouragement. We're looking at groups of children who are all nine years old and we're saying those three are the best, let's pull them out. Well, who is the best at nine years old? Well, it's children who are the eldest in their class, those born closest to the cutoff. So the ones who are nine years, 10 months, nine years, 11 months, and nine years, 11 and a half months, who are 10 to are be the best. best. At, at, when you're nine years old, 11 months can be four inches in height. It can be 25 pounds. It can be the difference between being uh, a, a klutz and someone who's incredibly coordinated. And so we, we think there that we, what we've done is identify people who have extraordinary individual talent. We actually have it. We've created a system that, uh, that uh, confers a special benefit on children born in a certain part of the year. And that benefit persists. And those kids are the ones who end up 10 years later being in playing all-star, playing in the NHL, or playing professional football or soccer around the world. Oh, do That's, you think this, this applies to... Uh, I don't know, finance, uh, that, that there were some kids who seemed at a young age a, a little bit more talented at math or mm -hmm. and that they get a, a certain amount of attention by teachers and parents and, and they're it's so snowballs. they're smart and then it's reinforced. Yeah, this is a, this principle in psychology is called the Matthew effect after the line in the Bible. Uh, he from, to he who has much more will be given, right? It's this idea that it's called cumulative advantage, which is small initial advantages mushroom over time. The best data we have is on reading. A very, very small difference in reading ability at a very young age quickly mushrooms into a large difference. Why? Because if you're a little bit better at reading at the age of six, you'll read more, right? Because reading is easier and more pleasurable. And that little extra increment of reading that you do causes you to read even better than the person behind you. And the cycle reinforces itself until you have, by the time kids are, when kids are six, the difference in the amount they read is like this. When they're 12, the same kids, the difference is this. It's because of this snowballing effect that happens with, with, with small initial advantages growing. You could tell the story of the Beatles with regard to practice. The Beatles are a lovely example because we think that they, their story begins with their, the invasion of America in 1964, right? These four fresh-faced, practically teenagers who burst on the scene. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. They spend the really critical periods. They spend two years in Hamburg, Germany, has a house band in a strip club playing eight-hour sets seven days a week for months at a stretch. They have one of the most extraordinarily intensive apprenticeships in rock and roll. And if you think about what it takes to play, I mean, the typical set for a rock band is, what, an hour, an hour and a half? They did eight-hour sets, day in, day out. If you think about that, you realize if you force a group of young musicians to play together over that in that in that in that way for months at a stretch they're, they're you're forcing them to master all kinds of different genres to learn how to play together well to um to to write songs i mean everything you need to do particularly at the dawn of rock and roll to be the most dominant band um of your of your generation requires some kind of apprenticeship and lo and behold they have it and i would argue and many agree with me that um no hamburg no beatles um you know, you're, they're just not the band that we remember unless they had that kind of intensive um, training. But of course, it raises an interesting question to me, which is, you could imagine a lot of other bands being told, I've got good news for you, you've got a great gig in, in Hamburg, Germany. The, the bad news is you're going to have to play eight hours a day, yeah. seven days a week. And they would have said, no way, we're not going to do it. So something about that group 
made them relish the opportunity to do yes. enormous amounts of practice. And presumably so, that's true of, of some of these sportsmen and true of other yeah. people. That is, yes, it takes practice, but you need a certain mentality to want to practice, to want to practice the hell out of it. You know, the, what you have described is what I believe talent is. Talent is the desire to practice, right? It is that you love something or uh, so much that you're willing to make an enormous sacrifice and an enormous commitment to that, whatever it is, task, um, uh, game, sport, what have you. Um, I, that, when, I, when people use that word, we usually talk about something inherent in you, right? Some, and we think of something very specific. I don't think that's what talent is. I think talent is simply desire. It's what you said of the Beatles. Their talent consisted of their ability to see Hamburg as an opportunity. Whereas 99 out of 100, it was. I mean, of, of delusion, you know, to be able to see opportunity in Hamburg in 1959. Okay, so <laughs> Renee, can, can you hear me now? Okay, cool, cool. So I was just going to ask, um, what, uh, if you had to guess, what country would you think is responsible for the most plane crashes of all time? I mean, just a wild guess. I mean, no, no wrong answers. I mean. Okay, well, a Africa, that, that's a continent, not, <laughs> not necessarily a country, but, but uh, and any guesses, again, wild guess. I mean, no wrong answers here. 
Okay, so Germany, good guess. The US, I guess. Russia. Actually, th th this is kind of interesting. And, um, and I apologize that I kind of logged off here for a second but just just let me know in the chat box if if you guys don't hear this but um actually it's south korea believe it or not and the reason is it's not because they're bad pilots or anything like that it's a cultural issue so this is kind of interesting where, where um malcolm Gladwell explains this And give me one second here. Okay. Malcolm, when you talk about what succeeds, some of what you talk about in terms of success and failure is not just the individuals, because as you say, that, that doesn't seem dominant. It's the environment around them, the culture around them, and some cultures, I mean, national cultures, mm -hmm. uh, seem better and worse. Yeah you found that by and large koreans were very bad at being pilots explain yes. that um uh, being a good pilot we think is a matter of technical skill it isn't really what um, about sully Salenberg? well he's such a he's such an outlier to the, to the theory of outliers um that's a very rare kind of plane crash um in fact i don't know if there'd ever been a successful water landing in the last 50 years um, most crashes have a very different form. Um, the overwhelming majority of crashes are the result of a breakdown in communication between the co-pilot and the pilot. Something comes up, a situation emerges that requires those two pilots to be in open and honest um, um, uh, communication, and they fail to do that. One person withholds information, one person doesn't share, whatever. They're invariably social failures. So the question is, this is why there's a cultural component. Is it easier in some cultures for an, a subordinate to speak openly and honestly to his superior than in other cultures? And the answer is absolutely. In fact, this is one of the dimensions on which cultures vary the most. It's called um, power distance, right? It is the respect for hierarchy. And there are some cultures that have zero respect for hierarchy and some cultures that are, for which that is the, the dominant paradigm of social interaction. Korea, as it happens, is a culture where, which has enormous respect for hierarchy, where power distance is a, in fact, the entire linguistic structure of the Korean language is infused with this sense of, how do I treat you if you are older and superior to me? I use specific pronoun forms. I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? Well, that is a, in 99% of, of cases, a beautiful and wonderful thing. In the, in the cockpit, it's a problem, right? And so you see, whenever you see cultures, if you overlay the list of cultures in the world by their respect for power distance with the list of cultures in the world by their plane crashes per capita, it's basically the same list. So, um, it's, so it's the ones that are hierarchical that have the most plane crashes. That has the most plane crashes. So you'll see, so classic, you know. And what, what did Korean Airlines do? They, 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 well, this is the other second part of this argument, which is this is not to say that cult, certain cultures are incapable of doing that task. It just means that if they want to get better, they have to address the cultural component of, of um, their interaction. <coughs> and that's exactly what Korean Air did. And they fixed their problem. Today, Korean Air, Korean Air was, through the 90s, one of the most dangerous airlines in the world. I mean, it was almost shut down at the end of the 90s by international aviation authorities. The Canadians told them at one point, you can't fly over Canada anymore. I mean, which is a real problem if you're trying to get from one end of the world to the other. And um, they fixed it. And they fixed it by bringing in people who have a different cultural attitude and essentially re-educating the pilots in Korean airlines. And they made them speak in English because they, they said it's a non-hierarchical language. It's a non-hierarchical language. They wanted to think like, you know, I mean, non-hierarchical cultures are America, Israel, Austria, Australia. They wanted them to think like Australians, essentially, right? What do you do? Well, you, bring, you make them speak English, right? And it works. I mean, this is the and this is the sort of hopeful lesson at the core of my book, which is that um, when we acknowledge how much of success is embedded in culture, that's a hopeful thing because culture is malleable. It's something we can address if we put our minds to it. So when you look at America today, mm -hmm. what elements of our culture are, are producing the kind of problems we see? I mean, a bad education system, for example. Yeah, I think that. Um, 
we are uh, uh, we have carried in the educational realm. We have carried our obsession with individualism too far, and paradoxically. We have an enormous amount to learn, I think, from Asian cultures like Korea. I mean, just as they can learn from us on flying planes, we can learn from them on education. If you go to Korea or China or Hong Kongers and you ask them, what does it take to be good at math? Their answer would be, being good at math is a function of how hard you work, right? Now, hard work is something that is available to all students, regardless of intellectual ability. So when you come in with that perspective, your expectation is everyone can work. The dull child can work as hard as, in fact, the dull child may, be, may find it easier to work harder than the smart child. That work-based perspective on achievement allows you, I think, to serve the needs of a much broader um, uh, pool of students than our, we have an ability-based approach, right? We're constantly segregating kids according to their aptitude, right? Whatever on earth that is. Now, I think we would do well to banish that word and simply, I think we should, we should separate kids according to how hard they want to work. You know, the kids who want to do their homework should ought to be in one, you know, and if you don't want to do your homework, I think we should say, then you have a problem. And we should, I don't care if you have an IQ of 150, you have a problem. You know, you have to, <laughs> a work-based culture is, at the end of the day, a far more effective means of, of raising the middle. Malcolm Gladwell, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. And we will be right back. So you, you kind of see the... Uh the dynamic of what I was talking about here. Let me just close this here for a second. Malcolm, would you? Okay. So I tell you what, I, I, I do want to get to the rest of what he talks about in Outliers. And I know that I think it was Renee that said that, that she has the book Outliers. Um, but just for the, the last couple of about 15 minutes, um, we, we have a little bit left after that, but I just want to introduce you guys to Malcolm Gladwell's last book. And it's, it's really phenomenal because we'll talk more about this uh, next week. And actually this, this will be sort of, kind of tied to the timed essay for for next week but the point though is that if you look at the the biblical story about david and goliath and once again this is not a, a like a bible class or anything like that you know so <laughs> so don't, so don't worry about that but um if you look at the story though itself and you look at what happens today in the modern age, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, ironic because if you look at the story itself, David and Goliath were, uh, you know, two different types of people, right? You know, David was this young kid and Goliath was this huge giant and but if you look at the biblical story itself, and this is one of the reasons why this is important for, for this class, if you look at the text, okay, this is why it's so important. Look at the text itself. You realize that um, actually Goliath, he was this huge giant. Actually, if you study the text, he was not a giant at all. Um, and um, it kind of very, very specifically that uh, Gladwell late lays this out. So let me just go ahead here and play this and then we'll wrap up for um, today. And actually, you know what? I, I have this on my slides, but um, let me go ahead here and put this up on the internet. And you, you, you see Velvet Revolver there, but uh, give me one second. Okay, so this is kind of cool, and this we'll we'll wrap up right after this, and we'll we'll talk more about this on in next week's class. But Dove Advanced Care's new formula enriched with one. 
Sorry for the stupid ads. So I wanted to tell a story that uh, that really obsessed me when I was writing my new book. And um, it's a story of something that happened 3,000 years ago when the kingdom of Israel was in its infancy. And it takes place in an area called the Shephelah um, in what is now uh, Israel. And the reason the story obsessed me is that I thought I understood it. And then I went back over it and I realized that I didn't understand it at all. Um, ancient Palestine had a... Uh, along its eastern border, there's a mountain range, still same is true of Israel today, and in the mountain range are all of the ancient cities of that region. So Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron. Um, and then there's a coastal plain right along the Mediterranean where Tel Aviv is now. And connecting the mountain range with the coastal plain is an area called the Shephala, which is a series of valleys and ridges that run east to west. And you can follow the Shefla, through the, go through the Shefla to get from the coastal plain to the mountains. And the Shefla, if you've been to Israel, you'll know it's just about the most beautiful part of Israel. It's gorgeous with uh, forests of oak and wheat fields and vineyards. And, but more importantly, though, in the history of that region, it served, it's had a, a, a real strategic function. And that is, it is the means by which hostile armies on the coastal plain find their way, get, get up into the mountains and threaten those living in the mountains. And 3,000 years ago, that's exactly what happens. The Philistines, who are the, the biggest of enemies of the kingdom of Israel, are living in the coastal plain. They're originally from Crete. They're a seafaring people. And they may start to make their way through one of the valleys of the Shephelah up into the mountains, because what they want to do is occupy the highland area right by Bethlehem and split the kingdom of Israel in two. And the kingdom of Israel, which is headed by King Saul, obviously catches wind of this, and Saul brings his army down from the mountains, and he confronts the Philistines in the Valley of Elah, one of the most beautiful of the valleys of the Shephelah. And the Israelites dig in along the northern ridge, and the, uh, the Philistines dig in along the southern ridge, and the two armies just sit there for weeks and stare at each other because they're deadlocked. Neither can attack the other because to attack the other side, you've got to come down the mountain into the valley and then up the other side and you're completely exposed. So finally, to break the deadlock, the Philistines send their mightiest warrior down into the valley floor. And he calls out and he says to the Israelites, send your mightiest warrior down and we'll have this out, just the two of us. This was a tradition in ancient warfare called single combat. It was a way of settling disputes without incurring the bloodshed of a major battle. And the Philistine who is sent down, their mighty warrior, is a giant. He's six foot nine. Uh, he's outfitted head to toe in this glittering bronze armor. And he's got a sword and he's got a javelin. And he's got a spear. He is absolutely terrifying. And he's so terrifying that none of the Israelite soldiers want to fight him. It's a, it's a death wish, right? There's no way they think they can take him. And finally, the only person who will come forward is this young shepherd boy. And he goes up to Saul and he says, I'll fight him. And Saul says, Saul says, you can't fight him. That's ridiculous. You're this kid. This is this mighty warrior. But the shepherd is adamant. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. I have been defending my flock against uh, lions and wolves for years. I think I can do it. And Saul has no choice. He's got, no one else has come forward. So he says, all right. And then he turns to the kid. He says, but you've got to wear this armor. You can't go as you are. So he tries to give the shepherd his armor. And the shepherd says, no. He says, I, I, I can't wear this stuff. I, I, the biblical verse is, I, have not, I cannot wear this for I have not proved it. Meaning I've never worn armor before. You've got to be crazy. So he reaches down instead on the ground and picks up five stones and puts them in his shepherd's bag and starts to walk down the mountainside to meet the giant. And the giant sees this figure approaching and calls out, come to me so I can feed your flesh to the, to the birds of the heavens and the, and the beasts of the field, right? He issues this kind of taunt towards this person coming to fight him. And the shepherd draws closer and closer and the giant sees that he's carrying a staff. That's all he's carrying, right? Instead of a weapon, just this shepherd's staff. And he says, 
am I, a, he's insulted. Am I a dog that you would come to me with sticks, right? And the shepherd boy takes one of his stones out of his pocket, puts it in his sling and whirls it around and lets it fly and it hits the giant right between the eyes, like right here in his most vulnerable spot. And he falls down either dead or unconscious. And the shepherd boy runs up and takes his sword and cuts off his head. And the Philistines see this and they turn and they just run. <laughs> and of course the name of the giant is Goliath and the name of the shepherd boy is David. And the reason that story has obsessed me over the course of writing my book is that everything I thought I knew about that story turned out to be wrong. So David in that story is supposed to be the underdog, right? In fact, that term, David and Goliath, has entered our language as a metaphor for improbable victories by some weak party over someone far stronger. Now, why do we call David an underdog? Well, we call him an underdog because he's a kid, little kid, and Goliath is this big, strong giant. We also call him an underdog because uh, Goliath is an experienced warrior and David is just a shepherd. Right? But most importantly, we call him an underdog because all he has is this giant is that, is that Goliath is outfitted with all of this modern weaponry, right? this glittering coat of armor and, a, and a, a sword and a javelin and a spear. And all David has is this sling. Well, let's start there with the phrase, all David has is this sling, because that's the first mistake that we make. In ancient warfare, there are three kinds of warriors. There's cavalry, men on horseback and in, with chariots. There is heavy infantry, which are foot soldiers, armed foot soldiers with uh, swords and shields and some kind of armor. And there's artillery. And artillery are archers, but more importantly, slingers. And a slinger is someone who has a leather pouch with two long cords attached to it. And they put a projectile, either a rock or a lead ball, inside the pouch. And they whirl it around like this. And they let one of the cords go. And the effect is to send the projectile forward at, um, uh, towards its target. That's what David has. And it's important to understand that that sling is not a slingshot. It's not this. Right? It's not a child's toy. It's, in fact, an incredibly devastating weapon. When David rolls it around like this, he's, he's turning his, uh, this thing around probably at six or seven revolutions per second. And that means that when the ball is, when the rock is released, it's going forward really fast, probably 35 meters per second. That's substantially faster than uh, uh, baseball thrown by um, even the finest of baseball pitchers. More than that, the stones in the Valley of Elah were not normal rocks. They were barium sulfate, which are rocks twice the density of normal stones. If you do the calculations on the ballistic, on the stopping power of the rock fired from David's sling, it's roughly equal to the stopping power of a 45 millimeter handgun. Right? This is an incredibly devastating weapon. Accuracy, we know from uh, historical records that slingers uh, had, experienced slingers could hit um, and maim or serious or, or even kill a target at distances of up to 200 yards. From medieval tapestries, uh, we know that slingers were capable of hitting birds in flight. They're incredibly accurate, right? When David lines up, and he's not 200 yards away from Goliath, he's quite close to Goliath. When he lines up and fires that thing at Goliath, there is, he has every intention and every expectation of being able to hit Goliath at his most vulnerable spot between his eyes. If you go back over the history of ancient warfare, you will find time and time again that slingers were the decisive factor against infantry in one kind of battle, against heavy infantry in one kind of battle um, or another. So what's Goliath? He's heavy infantry and his expectation when he challenges the Israelites to a duel, is that he's going to be fighting another heavy infantry, right? When he says, come to me that I might feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field, the key phrase is come to me, come up to me, because we're going to fight hand to hand like this. Saul has the same expectation. David says, I want to fight Goliath, and Saul tries to give him his armor, because Saul is thinking, oh, when you say fight Goliath, you mean fight him in hand to hand combat infantry on infantry. But David has 
absolutely no expectation. No, he's not going to fight him that way. Why would he? He's a shepherd. He spent his entire career using a sling to defend his flock against lions and wolves. That's where his strength lies. So here he is, this shepherd, experienced in the use of a devastating weapon, up against this lumbering giant weighed down by a hundred pounds of armor and these incredibly heavy weapons that are useful only in short range combat. Goliath is a sitting duck. He doesn't have a chance, right? So why do we keep calling David an underdog? And why do we keep referring to his victory as improbable? It's the second piece of this that's important. It's not just that we misunderstand David and his choice of weaponry. It's also that we profoundly misunderstand Goliath. Goliath is not what he seems to be. There's all kinds of hints of this in the biblical text. Um, things that are in retrospect are quite puzzling and don't square with his image as this mighty warrior. So to begin with, the Bible says that Goliath is led onto the valley floor by an attendant. Now that is weird, right? Here is this mighty warrior going, challenging the Israelites to one-on-one -on -one combat, why is he being led by the hand, by some, you know, young boy, presumably, to the point of combat? Secondly, the Bible story uh, makes special note of how slowly Goliath moves. Another odd thing to say when you're describing the mightiest warrior known to man at that point, right? And then there's this whole weird thing about how long it takes Goliath to react to the, to the sight of David. So David's coming down the mountain and he's clearly not preparing for hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? There is nothing about him that says, I'm about to fight you like this. He's not even carrying a sword. Why does Goliath not react to that? It's as if he's oblivious to what's going on that day. And then there's this strange, that strange comment he makes to David. Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? Right? Sticks? David only has one stick. Well, it turns out that there's been a great deal of speculation within the medical community over the years about uh, whether there's something wrong with, fundamentally wrong with Goliath, an attempt to make sense of all of those apparent anomalies. There been many articles written. The first one was in 1960 in the Indiana uh, Medical Journal, and it started a chain of speculation that starts with an explanation for Goliath's height. So Goliath is head and shoulders above all of his peers in that era. And usually when someone is that far out of the norm, there's an explanation for it. So the most common form of giantism uh, is a condition called acromegaly. And acromegaly is caused by a benign tumor on your uh, pituitary gland that causes an overproduction of human growth hormone. And throughout history, many of the most famous giants have all had acromegaly. So the tallest person of all time was a guy named Robert Wadlow, who was still growing when he died at the age of 24, and he was 8 foot 11. He had acromegaly. Do you remember the wrestler Andre the Giant, famous? He had acromegaly. There's even speculation that uh, Abraham Lincoln had acromegaly. Anyone who's unusually tall, that's the first uh, explanation we come up with. And acromegaly has a very distinct set of side effects associated with it, principally having to do with uh, vision. Uh, the pituitary tumor, as it grows, often starts to compress the visual nerves in your brain, with the result that people with acromegaly have either uh, double vision or they are profoundly nearsighted. So when, we, when people have started to speculate about what might have been wrong with Goliath, they said, wait a minute, he looks and sounds an awful lot like someone who has acromegaly. And that would also explain so much of what was strange about his behavior that day, right? Why does he move so slowly and have to be escorted down into the valley floor by an attendant? Because he can't make his way on his own, right? Why is he so strangely oblivious to David that he doesn't understand that David's not going to fight him until the very last moment? Because he can't see him. Right? When he says, come to me that I might feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field, the phrase come to me is a hint also of his vulnerability. Come to me because I can't see you. Right? And then there's 
uh, am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? He sees two sticks when David has only one. So the Israelites up on the mountain ridge looking down on him thought he was this extraordinarily powerful foe. What they didn't understand was that the very thing that was the source of his apparent strength was also the source of his greatest weakness. And there is, I think, in that a very important lesson for all of us. Giants are not as strong and powerful as they seem. And sometimes the shepherd boy has a sling in his pocket. Okay, so let's just, uh, I know that we're almost out of, out of time here, and we're going to get it more into this for, the, for, for Monday, but, um, and I, I do want to go through a, a couple other things, but, um, but does anybody have any questions? J j just uh, t uh, let me know in the, in the chat box. And you know, I think that the the message though that that Gladwell sends, and also let me let me go ahead here and start. I should have done this earlier. I, I apologize, but uh, um, you know, I don't even see the the video. Any, anyways, but. Um, one of the things that Gladwell talks about is uh, about this ability of a lot of students, and I'll get more into this on, on Monday, but he talks about how there are a lot of students that end up going to like Harvard uh, or, or the, these Ivy League schools, and um, they don't do as well as you think that they, they would. And one of the Gladwell's points with this uh, David and Goliath video or, or his, his book actually, is he explains how people in our culture tend to think that, oh, well, you have to go to a Harvard level school to, to be successful. Actually, he points out that that's not very true at all. So kind of kind of interesting. But um, let me kind of open this up to if anybody has any has any questions for for today's class, and we'll we'll pick up on this on on Wednesday, of course. But I just want to open it up the last four minutes of class. If any, anybody has any questions. And well, actually, as we're doing this, I mean, does anybody also feel the same way that you don't have to <laughs> go to an Ivy League school to be successful? I mean, can anybody think of any personal examples of that? Anybody in the chat box? Okay. Yeah, it is, it is kind of interesting. We'll take a look more at this uh, on, on Monday, of course. And we will definitely, you know, get more into like th this whole topic on, <laughs> on, on Monday. And uh, remember, just a heads up for next Wednesday, uh, remember that I've chosen the topic, so, but it's nothing to be intimidated by. So, so you'll get to class on Wednesday and I'll give you a topic and then you just have to go ahead and, and, and just write an essay on it, but, uh, but nothing to be intimidated by. So, so no worries. And especially if you 
just watch this class and then also on Monday's class, you'll be fine. So before I wrap up here again, I, I have the attendance, but does anybody have any last minute questions? Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here for today, but remember that this will be on YouTube later on, uh, you know, this afternoon. Um, and I assume like I have everybody's attendance, but uh, if you need to check up on this again later today, this will be on uh, YouTube. And so I'll talk to everybody a little bit later on Monday. So we'll meet again Monday. Thanks.